So I uh, thought I'd talk to you about gifts this morning. What can you give? I was telling Josh on the way here that I had a sermon that I gave about five years ago. Is this in the way? Thank you, sir. And it was answering a question. Why? Why would God send his son to the earth? And I really wanted to preach that sermon again. However, something happened along the way, and it seemed like talking about gifts was just much more important. Because after all, is that what Christmas is all about? Gifts? Well, for most people in the world, they think that they are basing their gift giving on the three wise men. That's a traditional model of giving gifts and giving them at this time of the year in relationship to Christmas. The question comes to mind, what's God giving you for Christmas? Or let's make it more important, what are you giving God for Christmas? What does he want from us? What's on his list? A little girl, could have been one of mine, was sitting on her grandpa's lap, giving her grandpa this list, an enormous list of what she would like to have for Christmas. When children can start watching TV and see all of those ads for presents, toys, or in my day and some of you, about this time of year, a little bit earlier, Sears and Roebuck sent out the wish book. You remember the wish book? And I wished for a lot. Well, this little girl was sitting on her grandpa's knee, relating all of those things that she wished for. Grandpa thought, this is a teachable moment. And all parents are supposed to watch for teachable moments when you can teach your children some important fact of life. So grandpa said, sweetie, it is more pardon? Say again. And the little girl said, I know, but I'd be happy just to receive. That's the way most of us are, isn't it true? It's pretty true, I think, whether you want to admit it or not. What are you hoping to receive this Christmas? Don't tell me. American Express did a survey and found that the 31% of the people said that if they got a fruitcake, they'd rather have just gotten nothing. I don't understand it. I love a good fruitcake. How do people get rid of the gifts they get that they don't want? Regift, I heard somebody say. They say about 19% regift. You know, give it to somebody else. If you've got the time or you've got the room to save it until next year. Or 21% take it back to the store themselves. Stores are pretty good about taking things back these days. 30% chose to hide it in a closet. I think one of the best ways to take care of those gifts that you don't really want is a white elephant event. You know, give it to somebody else and you get some of the junk they don't want in return. Well, Gifts are fun to talk about, great to receive, and sometimes a problem to know what to do with them. But there are several gifts that God gives us. And as I went back through my notes over the past years, I've had a couple of sermons on gifts that God gives us. And I came up with looking at those and came out with three gifts 
that I want to emphasize that God gives you this morning. Probably, Dave, the best one, number one on my list was forgiveness. Amen. 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 I certainly, that's a little loud, if you will. I certainly want to be forgiven for my mistakes. Amen. And the second gift that God gives, this one is an amazing thing. He gives houses away. Think of it in the everyday terms, you know, it's nice to say he's going to give me a heavenly mansion, but I'm, I'm happy with it's just a two-bedroom model. And the third gift that I have down, a lot of people like this, I see it advertised all the time on TV, a makeover. You know, if you're not quite happy with yourself, God is willing to make you over. And if you want me to go get the scriptures for all three of those, I could do that. But I'm not going to take the time for it this morning unless somebody screams. But a makeover is a very important thing to a lot of people. God is giving us great gifts. How many people got up this morning? Was it a gift? And to... To, to be able to walk around and to enjoy the weather, whether it's what you want or not, it'll be okay tomorrow, it's going to snow. Let's try to understand what are the gifts that God wants from us. It's not hard to receive gifts from God. I'm going to stand here and I can see you. That's a fantastic fantastic gift from God, isn't it? Especially since I can see you in color. But what's he want from us? I recently read a story of two Americans who had been invited to the Soviet Union to teach, theo not theology, they wouldn't have agreed to that, ethics kind of another word for how you're supposed to behave, right? So they were teaching ethics and they were going to police stations and they were going to hospitals. And one of the places they were to go and teach ethics was a large orphanage. About a hundred children there. And they decided that the best thing that children would really appreciate the most was the Christmas story. The story of Mary and Joseph arriving in Bethlehem and finding no room in the inn. Oh, by the way, did you know the Bible doesn't condemn the innkeeper for turning them away? Think about it. He's not a bad person. No room in the inn. So the couple went where? They went to a stable. And Actually, if we think about it, that was quite kind of the innkeeper to give them any place to stay. Where the baby Jesus was born and placed in a manger. Throughout the story, the children sat in amazement hearing the story. Because these uh, storytellers were much better than Robert. And the children sat on the edge of their little stools and their benches, listening to something they had really no idea what it was all about. And to wrap up the story, these kind people from the states decided that they would have the children create a manger scene of their own. So they gave each child three pieces of cardboard from which to fa fashion a manger. And then they gave each child a yellow napkin to tear into strips and make straw for the manger. And then they gave each child a piece of flannel that they cut out of an old nightgown. And they gave each child a piece of tan felt to cut into the shape of a little baby. Everything was going well. The children didn't have too many questions. They knew what to do. And they were doing it. And the American teachers 
walked around and looked and saw, yes, that one is good, that one is good, until they got to Misha. Misha had something different about his understanding of the story. And so, through an interpreter, one of the teachers asked, tell me what's going on here. And so Misha could tell them about Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem and the manger. And he was doing very well. Mary had the baby and put it in the manger. And then he started ad-libbing. And he said, I looked down into the manger and I talked to Jesus. And he asked me where I had to sleep. And I told him I had no mama. I had no papa. Nobody would take care of me and give me a place to sleep. And in this story, Jesus spoke to Misha again, and Misha said, what if I got in bed with you to keep you warm? Would that be a good gift for you? And Jesus told him it would be a fantastic gift. So Misha climbed into the manger with the baby Jesus and laid next to him. Hence, the teachers saw two babies in Misha's manger. And Misha said, I asked Jesus if it was okay that I was here. And he said, yes, and that I could stay with him forever. That's the gift, folks. That is the whole point of the story. Where do you want to be forever? Jesus is giving us a gift of being with him forever, and we can keep him warm. I'd like to tell you that the all-time best gift that's ever been given is Jesus Christ himself. And don't hide it in a closet. Don't fail to open it. Because once you open it, you can't give it back. You can share it, but you can't re-gift it. It's this season of generosity that we give things. We spend more than we can really afford on people we don't really like. And this custom I mentioned earlier is established by the wise men. We believe, we say. And so we don't really bring gifts to Jesus as much today as we just bring gifts to each other, don't we? Yes, I think so. We think about the gifts, we agonize over them, we spend, we endure almost any inconvenience in order to buy just the right gift for others. One of my daughters told me that she wanted a an antique that we used to have in our home when she was a little girl. So I'm looking for one. I finally found the item that she wanted in Minneapolis, and I was considering driving up there to get it. What wouldn't we do for the right gift, right? I wonder if just once, one Christmas, we could make a covenant to spend as much time and energy and thought in giving a gift to Jesus as we do to each other. The prophet Micah must have been thinking about some of this problem of gifting. You know, Micah 6, 6 through 8 was read for us this morning for our text. A kind of unusual text for a Christmas-themed sermon. I was so happy I get to to tell the first Christmas sermon of the season. Micah 6, 6 through 8. Micah asked, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? 
And we need to pause right there for a moment in our reading. If you read too fast, it kind of you lose a little bit from what's being said. Because then Micah answers the question. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require? Now some of you may remember from our text earlier. His requirement, there are three of them, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. What shall I bring the Lord? That's my challenge. What are you going to bring the Lord? God doesn't really want much. It may be difficult, but he doesn't asking for a lot. And you can't buy it with money. Just three things. I wonder what Christmas would be like if all Christians in the church bundled these things up and that's what they gave the Lord for the next year. I would sure like to say that I'm going to be doing that and done that. But I'd like to look at the three gifts that he's asked for in a little detail. The first one. To act justly. There doesn't seem to be much justice in the world that I'm aware of. You look around you, you feel it every day. Things just don't seem right. The rich get richer. The poor get poorer. The bad seem to succeed and the good seem to fail. Everything seems topsy-turvy. It's hard to understand what justice really is. My father used to tell me what I thought was a joke, but it's too true. He would say, steal $10 and end up in jail. Steal a million and be a congressman. Certainly an indicator of what we think justice is, isn't it? You know, we uh, who watch the news on TV or read it in newspapers or on the Internet, we hear about juries deliberating over some case that we've heard nothing but coverage in the news for years or months or whatever. And we wonder how... How did they ever come to that conclusion? How did they ever decide this was the right thing? This was justice. Sometimes it's well beyond our understanding what's going on here. I heard about an automobile accident which a father and three children had been killed and a broadside hit them. The woman driving the car that hit them was drunk. Yes, she was speeding. She ran a red light. Three people killed, family wiped out. And she didn't get hurtled at all. Where's, where's the fairness and justice in that? There isn't any. There's so much in the world that isn't fair. You don't mind my switching to another word for justice, right? Fair. I'm going to suggest that you and I can wrap up a justice gift for the coming year that we can give to our Lord. Lord, we don't care what else the world may do, but as your people, we promise to be fair in our dealings with others. We'll always be honest in the things we say. We'll always be fair and just in the things we do. I don't know if I can do this one. We won't complain. We'll not argue or fight with one another. I know the next one's hard for a lot of people. We won't gossip. We'll always be fair. 
What would it be like if we could all take that pledge on just and fairness? And keep it! It's one thing to take a pledge, it's quite another to keep it, isn't it? God told Micah the second thing he wanted was mercy. To love mercy. Mercy is a, a terminology that most of us don't get too much in our everyday use. You don't feel merciful towards other people too often. So I thought of another word I could use for mercy. Kindness. Are you kind? Of course you are, right? That's asking you. Let's ask the people around you. Are you kind? I think you can express mercy to God's children through acts of kindness. It's hard to find kindness today. So many people are unkind, right? Have you ever been treated unkindly? Have you ever treated anyone unkindly? Of course you don't have to answer those rhetorical questions. Have you ever had that sinking feeling inside when you feel that people don't really care about you? In fact, I know that some of you have told me you did. What about rejection? How does it feel to be rejected? Think about the lepers in the New Testament. Wherever they went, they were shunned. People ran away from them. People said mean things to them. Their families would have nothing to do with them. And it is easy to say, yes, but there was a good reason to stay away from them. You know, to shun them. Because I don't want to catch leprosy myself. We know today that it wasn't contagious. But people thought it was. And it was a nice, good excuse to be unkind. You know, some people just enjoy being unkind. Seems to make them feel good. But yet, when Jesus came along, he treated them with kindness. What did they get for his kindness? How does it express? He healed them. He didn't run from them. A doctor, I read this story, he was living in Colorado, just outside of Denver. He was driving home from a meeting with other doctors and hospital administrators, all of those kinds of people. And he was stuck in traffic. And all of a sudden, his car started lurching and the engine was running rough. And he thought he was going to get stuck right there in the middle of the main lane on that freeway. But it held together enough and he got off at the next exit and he coasted down that exit to a filling station. Well, he parked the car in an area out of the way and started to go inside to make a phone call, to call for a ride and to call for a tow truck to pick up the car. And as he was heading towards the, the main office of the filling station there, he saw a young woman come out, stumbling across the pavement of the filling station. And it looked like she slipped on the ice and almost fell. But as he got closer, he realized she didn't slip on the ice. She was overcome with sobbing. She was so distraught. And he said, I hurried over to where she was and I took her by the elbow to hold her up and give her some stability on that icy pavement. And as I did that, she, something fell out of her hand and I looked down. It was a nickel. And as she just opened up to tell her story, she was from Kansas. And she had three children in the car with her, an old uh, minivan. And one of those kids in the car was still in the car seat. Gives you an idea how old they were. 
And she said, let's step to the other side of the pump. I don't want the kids to see me crying. So they did that. And she told the doctor, she said, uh, my boyfriend left me two months ago. And uh, we're really destitute. We can't take care of ourselves. And I realized that I wouldn't be able to pay the rent for January 1st. So I called my parents. My parents haven't heard from me in five years. Can you imagine that? That seems beyond my comprehension. If I don't hear from my children at least once a week, I'm worried about them. Five years. Her parents had told her, yes, you can come and stay with us. And so she had packed everything she had in the minivan, including the three children, and was headed for California. I don't know how far you can get outside of Denver on a nickel, but she was going. And so when the doctor heard the story, he said to her, so you prayed and God sent me. And she stepped back away from him. Who's this crazy guy? Now, if you say anything about prayer today, people think you're crazy. Come on, you think you're crazy too a little once in a while. So, having had this unwind in the story, he got the kids out of the car. He put his credit card in the gas pump and filled the tank up. And they went over to the McDonald's where they got happy meals and hamburgers and french fries and all of that good stuff that kids love. And he said they devoured it like they hadn't eaten in days. And they may not have. And so he bought five bags of Happy Meals and some whatever else they sell there for mom. And they got him to the car. And uh, as they were walking over together, the woman said to this fella, so, are you like a, a, an angel or something? And they said, this definitely made me cry. I said, sweetie, at this time of year, angels are really busy. So sometimes God uses regular people. It was so incredible to be a part of God's miracle. And of course, you may have guessed it. When the doctor got back in his car, it started right up. And he drove home without any further problem. He said, I'll put it in the shop tomorrow just to check, but I suspect they won't find anything wrong. This woman was definitely the least of these. You know from the text, whatever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. She was the least. She had no way of repaying the favor. And no one would notice if the kind stranger just ignored her. How many experiences have you passed by where you could have been the kind stranger? i be honest, I have. I'm ashamed to say I've done it. I felt too busy, too far to go, no extra time. And she was probably drinking anyway. Kindness can be shown so easily. And it is the gift that's probably most desired in all people in the world, is a gift of kindness. And that was number two on God's list. And so I make a promise to you. I'll do my utmost not to pass by opportunities to be kind to someone. And they don't have to be people who are in dire straits either. The third thing God told Micah was to walk humbly with God. I don't know what humbleness is. I'm not humble. Once in a while I try to tell myself I am. But I know better. I'm not humble. 
I was somewhat like the people at Jesus' time. You know, the Greeks, they thought they were the cream of the crop. You know, they had all the knowledge and the, they were really great people. However, they were on their way out and down because the Romans, the proud Romans were taking, them, taking over. You know, what's your picture of a Roman centurion? Big red plume on his helmet and shiny armor, riding some stallion through the streets. And when you said, jump, everybody around you got out of your way. Wow, I, I like that kind of, that's a nice idea. I'd like to be into that situation. And, and if you really were proud, you'd wear lots of jewelry and flash to the, to the poor people as how good you were. You wanted to impress others. 2,000 years passed, we still like to impress each other. You know, the right brand clothing, just the right places to go, just the right car to drive, and a nice new big house. I find it difficult to really be humble. I think maybe I'm a product of the culture I live in. Yet to Micah, the Lord said, walk humbly with God. Walk humbly with God. Now, I'll tell you what my problem is. You see, God, I don't want to do things your way. I'm just as smart as anybody else. And, you know, I know the good way to do things. How can I be humble, God, when I know as much as you do? Uh, somebody told me that's what happened to Lucifer in heaven, wasn't it? Humility is important, but yet... Most of us really aren't very humble. There is a nice benefit. If you can figure out the way, if you can actually do it, the benefit is when we walk humbly with God, he'll walk with us. Did you get it? I didn't hear an amen. I want God to walk with me. Amen. And I know that if I'm not humble, he can't do it. And humble often is how I treat you. One of my favorite Christmas stories, and you may have heard it because this is a well-known story, is about the old shoe cobbler. He dreamed one Christmas Eve that Jesus would come and visit him the next day. He was sure of it. I have lots of dreams, don't you? But I'll tell you what, I'm not too sure that they're really going to happen. Maybe they shouldn't. But this cobbler was sure his dream would come true, that Jesus would actually come. So the first thing he did when he got up early before sunrise is he started sweeping. He swept out his little uh, place that he worked, his workshop. And he went out and he got some green boughs and he decorated the place. He wanted to make it enticing to be there. And as, as he was working, making things nice, he noticed someone, an old man, came for a moment. He came inside, opened the door and came inside to get out of the cold, to get into the warm shop. And they sat down and they talked for a while. And the cobbler said, I noticed we crossed his legs and there was a great big hole in the sole of his shoe. He couldn't get warm that way, that was for sure. So the cobbler said, I reached up on the shelf and I got down a pair of shoes in his size. And I went to another bin and I got some hand knitted wool socks. And I gave them to this man and I, he put them on and I bid him go on out into the cold again and continue on his way with warm feet. And as, as the cobbler was busying himself with the cleaning and the getting of things ready, he put a bowl of stew on the stove to cook for the noon meal. And he looked outside and there was an old woman poorly dressed 
and he invited her in. She hadn't had a meal in two days. They sat and visited a while, and he finished preparing that stew and gave her some to eat. And then she went on her way to where she was going. Then as he was sitting there and waiting sometime in the middle of the afternoon, he heard a little boy outside crying, right out in front of his shop. He went out and talked with the boy and discovered that the boy had gotten separated from his parents. He was lost. And he didn't know how to get home. So the cobbler put on his coat, took the boy by the hand, and led him home. And when he got back to his little shop, it was almost dark. The streets were empty. And then in a moment of despair, he lifted his voice to heaven and said, Oh, Lord Jesus, why didn't you come? Then in a moment of silence, he seemed to hear a voice saying, Oh, shoe cobbler, lift up your heart. I kept my word. Three times I knocked on your door. Three times my shadow fell across your floor. I was the man with the bruised feet. I was the woman you gave to eat. I was the boy on the homeless street. Jesus said, come. The cobbler didn't realize it. And I'm not saying there was anything wrong with him. It was his humbleness that allowed him to have those three wonderful experiences when Jesus came to his shop. So, God is asking you for three gifts. No money needed. You don't have to go to the dollar store and buy anything. Everyone here can give God that gift, all three of them, before you even leave your pew. We can bring them neatly wrapped and place them at the feet of Jesus, or you can you can make a covenant with him to give all three gifts all year long, not just today, not just on Christmas morning. And I suggest that if you start that this Christmas, this may very well be the best Christmas you'll ever have.